So if you're training for performance, and this is I'm applying this to people maybe over at age 50, um, then you know that's great. There's a lot of benefits from that. Your training is going to be focused. You're going to have specificity of training for the event that you're going for. You're going to do progressive overload to add on to your capability in that, in that event. You should still follow the 80-20 training, which means that 80% of your training should be a low intensity, lower than you might expect, and 20% should be very high intensity. And elite athletes are starting to transfer over to this training regimen. And um, I don't have time to go into details on it, but there's a lot of information online. If you are training for events, you should be thinking about this. It's, it ends up being better for performance and better for your heart in these um, endurance activities. Training for longevity is a little bit different. Uh, you wanna meet the physical activity guidelines. So moderate exercise or a ways above that, but not into the extreme category. So this is a paraphrasing of the general guidelines. Essentially, they suggest that you get at least 150 to 300 minutes, minutes of moderate intensity exercise per week of cardio. Uh, and the more intense it is, the less you have to do. So maybe down to 75 minutes and you can do some combination thereof. And that can be broken up into shorter sessions. So that's something that's added, has been added more recently. So you don't have to do like a 30 minute block. You can do five minutes here, 10 minutes there, whatever throughout your day. They also suggest that you do resistance exercise and flexibility exercise and uh, all muscle groups two to three times per week. And then some neuromotor exercise. So working on balance, agility, gait, uh, also two to three times a week. And they've added this more recently to avoid sitting whenever possible because it's its own health risk factor. We'll talk about that later. So this is a lot of time. This is this, the reason why people aren't meeting the guidelines is it's a lot of time to put into their day. So one way to address this issue of, you know, can you get away with less? Is there an impact at lower levels than the guidelines? Is to look at the relationship between moderate vigorous, vigor, moderate, vigorous physical activity and all cause mortality. And there are a lot of studies that look at this and they all have very similar shaped graphs. And so the Health and Human Services Department in the last physical activity guidelines um, sort of consolidated those graphs into this shape curve here. And what it says is if your risk of mortality here is normalized at one for the least active group, as you increase physical activity on this x-axis, you have a very steep early slope and then it starts to flatten out. And you can see the physical activity guidelines here. So I wanna draw attention to this side, the left side of the graph here, where you go from no physical activity to just a little bit, that first group, and you can decrease your risk of all-cause mortality by 20%. Once you get down to the guidelines, even on the early ends of the guidelines, then you're about 70% of the benefit is reached. And then the curve really starts to flatten out. So down here, you're training for something besides longevity. You're really training for performance. And a lot of the health benefits have already been obtained, which is fine. But um, you can see that the big gains come at this low end. Right? You want to have some bouts of high intensity exercise to keep that maximum capacity as high as you can. You want to move throughout your day and reduce your amount of sitting. And you want to do a variety of activities and add some resistance training and get outdoors and be social and play. You know, there was a very interesting study that came out of Copenhagen that looked at types of activities that people did and the amount of years it added to life. And it was a very surprising. Um, all the activities added, all the physical activities added uh, years of life. But the least effective one was gym activity. And that's a huge category, but working out in the gym. Next was running, cycling, and uh, swimming. And then the category that added the most years to life were things like tennis, uh, golf, uh, badminton. So a surprising finding, but it brings in sort of the outdoor activities, the social activities, um, and something that you can do for long periods of time. So it's very interesting. So the advantages to travel for, to training for longevity, that you compress morbidity so you're healthier for longer and disease comes later in your life and possibly add years of life to your longevity. As you enjoy movement and life more, you increase function and independence. Disadvantages, 
you won't win any marathons and life may be less convenient. So what I mean by that is in order to get that movement in your life throughout your day, to keep moving throughout the day, you have to make choices away from those things that we take that we have for convenience. So walking instead of driving, you know, doing some of your own chores, not using machines to do those. And so um, making, you're taking the stairs, for example. So making your life less convenient adds physical activity into your daily life. So in summary, your body is watching you and to age well, you wanna move regularly throughout the day, do it with others and play whenever possible. And remember, a convenient life is not necessarily a healthy life.